things. I'm serious. If you want to sit over here, I do thank you for the addition we have here. Do we have any announcements that that means to read it? That's my term. What about prayer? Our prayer request correctly. We'd have to start like a pray for our pastor. As you anybody mean that busy, hard to get here, always something going, and just. I'm not going to ask you to pray. I'm not there. I already told Austin. I said, don't even worry. We're just going to get right to it. Just over the on the life of David. David is my number one. reason I've studied him, I believe, is because. And I love that stuff. He's got. My rendition of the story is different. A lot of churches like ours, and it's a dog story, and there's nothing even killed Goliath. He wasn't a little boy. Wasn't David probably not stuff, so we just go back a year for that. So there's three things we're going to look at tonight. We're going to look at who the Philistine so much, and that is my favorite part of tonight. We're going to figure out. This lesson, what can we learn? Pray, and we'll get started. Family that are here, Lord. This Goliath lesson, Lord, to our life. Read and study along. It's really easy to personality. No different than me. So I've written down several things that I found off somebody else's commentary. And one thing I've learned when you're studying, when I substitute teach over at, uh, at life of a human being, okay? I think the way I react, how culturally things have changed. Not really any different. When you look at the Bible, one, to kill Goliath. So this is the main reasons I wanted everybody here down close is because we're about to watch a five-minute video. This five-minute video is the opening scene of the movie Troy. The movie Troy is about the Trojan horse and all that history. But the opening scene, the first time I watched it, I thought, wow, somebody gets the Bible. Whoever wrote this opening scene, they understood the David and Goliath battle. They understand what, what happened. You'll get to see personality traits that we talked about, but they had to change the characters' names. You've got different characters. You've got different countries that are fighting one another. You've got a different murder weapon, but you'll easily see who they are. Achilles is the young, athletic warrior played by none other ladies than Brad Pitt. He's going up against this huge man from Thessaly named Boagrius. You can easily see who Saul is in this opening scene of the movie. You can see how they had to paraphrase biblical scripture, but they took the Bible battle and put it theatrically so that we can see it. It's unbelievable. Testosterone will drop out of that screen. I wanted to show you this because it is the closest thing, the closest thing that you'll probably ever see is what the battle probably was like. Let's watch it. And we'll discuss. It's five minutes of, the, of perfection. If you like this kind of content.
good day for the crimes. I told you yesterday, and I'll tell you again today. Remove your army from my land. I like your land. I think we'll stay. I like your soldiers, too. They fought bravely yesterday. Not well, but bravely. They <laughs> won't fight for you. That's what the Messiahs said. And the Arcadians. And the Achaeans. Now, they all fight for me. You can't have the whole world having them. It's too big, even for you. I know what I'm watching on a massacre. Let's settle this war in the old manner. Your best fighter against my best. And if my man wins, we'll leave Thessaly for good. I'm a generous man. If mine wins, you can keep your throne. But Thessaly falls under my command to fight with me whenever I call. This has this effect on many heroes. Careful who you insult, old king. The king? The king is not with the army. Where is he? I sent the boy to look for him. A Thessalonian you're fighting. He's the biggest man I've ever seen. I wouldn't want to fight him. That's why no one will remember your name.
Oh, that fires me up. I can go back here and I could arm wrestle Titlow right now or something. Every line of that straight out of the Bible, if you've read the storyline. You can see, ladies, why they would have loved David. A couple things in there I just want to hash over. That scene where that little, that little boy was talking to Achilles, and he says, this, this Aelian you're about to fight, he's the biggest man I've ever seen. I wouldn't want to fight him. Achilles says, that's why no one will remember your name. That's straight David's personality. At the very end, when Achilles killed Boagrius, he's talking to the, the ruler of Thessaly. The ruler of Thessaly asked him who he was, and he told him, Achilles, son of Peleus. That's obviously paraphrased, but straight out of the Bible. And at the very end of that, a neat movie line, if you caught it, he says, the ruler of Thessaly carries this scepter. Give it to your king. Achilles says, I have no king. Achilles just answered the first question on tonight. Why did David have to be the one to kill Goliath? David had to be the one to kill Goliath because David was the king. I know that's a fact because the Bible said he was. For whatever reason, we skipped that part. To understand this story, any time you have a huge storyline in the Bible and you want to know the answers, just go backwards. It, it gives you all the answers 100% of the time. A lot of times what we get caught up in in churches, we see a major story event in Scripture. Because we know the ending, we have a tendency to skip through it because we're looking for symbolism. And I don't know why that is, but we do. I think it's just easy to preach. We're not going to look at symbolism. We're going to look at the battle because we've got to figure out, I'm going to tell you why David had to be the one to kill the king, <coughs> why he had to be the one to kill Goliath, rather, because he was the king. With this storyline, this is why this is a meat and potato Wednesday night lesson. You have to understand a lot of the Old Testament. Obviously, we don't have time to tell the whole story. So I've got to paraphrase, I don't know, 15, 20 chapters of the Bible here in just a few minutes to give you, let you understand why because the story is too important to skip over with David. This is what we remember about the Israelites. We know ever since the Israelites started, everywhere they went, every time they seen a town, city, country, a village, any time they seen that, they saw an example of somebody else having a king, so they wanted one themselves. We know the Bible says that God said, I'm not going to give you a king. They were asking for one. God said, I'm going to rule you with priests and prophets and judges. They said, no, we want a king anyway. God told Samuel, we don't have time to tell you who Samuel was. God told Samuel to tell the Israelites, if I give you a king, this is the negative stuff that's going to happen to you. And he lined it out for them. They said, we still want a king. So I can picture God rolling his eyes and telling Samuel to go get the first king. The first king's name was Saul. And it's a really cool storyline of how they went to get him. Saul, like most politicians, starts out really good, then he got corrupt. Okay, Saul did three major mistakes. It was so bad that God pulled himself away from Saul. It was so bad, God told Samuel to tell Saul he made these mistakes, to tell him he was going to pull himself away from him, and God told Samuel to tell Saul that he was fixing to go get another king. For some reason, we skipped that part when you hear the storyline. And it's a real cool storyline how Samuel went out and found the next king. His name was David, as we know. And this is how God worked things out. With, with, with David. One big, huge bullet point that we always forget to remember with this storyline of David being the king, when David was anointed king, it was not kept secret. Everybody knew it. How do I know? Because the Bible says they knew it. This is how God worked things out. We know from Scripture that Saul had depression, anxiety, worrying all the time. He was stressed out because God left him. We know that. <coughs> and we also know that Saul, like us, because we're the same, he loved his music. Okay? Just like us at Landmark. We love our music here at Landmark. We know from Scripture that Saul's government was paying attention to what David was doing. How do I know? Because the Bible said it. Look at the context. Somebody in his government reminded Saul, hey, remember David? He knows how to play music. Won't you hire him to come play for you? What's that old saying? You keep your friends close and your enemies closer? Saul didn't like him. We know from the storyline how God worked everything out. Let me paraphrase. When David was hired to do that job, David had full access to what we refer to as the White House. David would have had a parking pass. He'd have had one of those little badges that could get in and out of the back door. He would have known the security team, the cook team, the landscape team. He would have known all of the government, and he would have known all of the military. How do I know? Because the Bible tells it. It talks about it. 
We know how the storyline went. How do you think even David became best friends with Jonathan? Well, who is Jonathan? Well, read the story. Because he was there. A big part about this story is what we found out next. Was the and Obviously, I'm paraphrasing and having to skip. We know that the Israelites and the Philistines were once again at it. I mean, this time they were really at it. And the battle was taking longer than what it should. And the Bible even says why. We know that Jesse, that's David's father, comes to David. And let me paraphrase again. This is what he tells him. He says, go to Kroger up there. Get your water, get your cheese, get your crackers, get your beef jerky, your Gatorade, and your bananas and whatever. And I want you to go to the front line and figure out what's taking so long. Okay, how in the world would David have access to the front line unless he didn't know everybody? A little boy's not doing that. Okay, not a chance. He got to the front line. He was needing to get to the front line because some of Jesse's other his sons worked there or was in the, in the military. If you've ever worked on a farm, and most of you in here have, you know Jesse's concern. You need people to work on a farm, and he didn't have his people. That's easy to figure out that reason why he needed his sons back. And the Bible said why? Because the, this battle was taking too long. We know from the Bible that David rode to the front line. The very, very first thing that happened, he met with his brothers. His brothers get mad, angry, frustrated with him. Remember that? You want to know why? Because they knew his brother's personality. I have an older brother. I know my brother's personality as well as anybody, and he knows mine. Okay? Well, we were raised together. They didn't want him there. They didn't want him there because the brothers knew that David was the king. Okay? David, in the storyline, you should know it. He sees Goliath. David gets angry, mad, frustrated at everybody. Why hadn't you taken care of him? I have killed a lion. I have killed a bear. I can kill him. That's not a little boy telling you that story. And the next thing in the storyline lets you know it really wasn't a boy because David says, after I kill him, what am I going to get? You're going to be wealthy, it says. You're going to get the girl. What girl? Well, read the storyline. Saul's mind exploded when that happened because you can read the context on what happened after that. And you don't have to pay taxes. That's God talk right there. That's deer camp stuff right there. That's what, you know, that's, yeah, that's what you're going to do. And then we know the storyline. David, one reason I had you sitting down here, David's weapon of choice was a sling. I wanted to show you a shepherd's sling. A shepherd's sling... At the very end of this, you see the loop. The loop would go in your middle finger right here because it's comfortable. I'm right-handed. The other side, the other side would pinch between your thumb and your index or pointer, whatever you call it. You would hold it like this. A sling isn't round and round and round and round and round like you're going to lasso a calf. It's, it's one motion, like you're throwing a baseball. If you ever played baseball and you get a ground to hit to you, you're coming up and you're throwing in a hurry. How do I know? Because I've done it. It's not round and round and round. I've got limestone in my driveway. I put some limestone rock in here, and I threw it, and I was shocked. The, the velocity at which a rock will come out of this is unbelievable. I did it a few times. I went inside, got my wife. I said, come look at this. I said, I'm doing a story on David and Goliath. I said, I've got the sling. She goes, a sling? That ain't a sling. She says, I thought a sling was this. I go, no, this is a shepherd's sling. I said, watch how fast a rock comes out of this. Her jaw drops. She goes, I had no idea, and I said, I had no idea either. It takes a lot to impress me with a weapon, and I was shocked at how fast. I started to bring a marshmallow and hit up against that wall, but I didn't because I figured I'd shank it and I'd hit that stained glass window. <laughs> and the person who built that sitting right over there, then they would probably drown me in the baptistry if that was cracked. A marshmallow would crack that window out of this. It just would. The Bible also gives us some really cool stuff. It also says that David picked up five smooth stones from the brook. We don't use that terminology in our language. We use rocks and creek beds. Obviously, the smooth part is aerodynamic. Limestone, out of that sling, it does this. The next one does this. A smooth one goes straight. How do I know? Because I've thrown them. I mean, I, I brought some to show you. The Bible also says five. Let me set the record straight tonight. Let me tell you why David picked up five. You ready? Biblical secrets revealed tonight. David did not pick up five stones because Goliath had brothers. Nope. David did not pick up five stones because he needed more ammunition. No, that's preacher talk. Let me tell you when he picked up five. 
David would have picked up five different size stones for one reason and one reason only. He would not have known how close he was going to get to Goliath. That's kinetic energy 101. That's hunting 101. How do I know that? I was a professional hunter for 20 years. The closer you are to your game animal, I don't, it's hard for, I don't have a big enough hand. Ronnie does. Ronnie's got big hands. Stand up and show them, Ronnie. The closer you are, closer you are to your game animal, the bigger, the larger, more weight you need on your air broadhead or, or with a bullet. That's a fact. That is a fact. You need knockdown power. You need kinetic energy up close. David, as close as Goliath, was a getting to him, the bigger the rock he was a picking. Okay, the closer he was getting, the bigger the rock he was picking. I believe he shot, he hit one, hit him in the head with the biggest rock he had. I think he did it up close because they were running their mouth talking to each other. For people in this room who really understand grains and bullets and weights, this is going to blow your mind. And people, there's people in here that do. Carl knows, Tad knows. This one here weighed 436 grains heavier than this one. How do I know? Because I weighed them on my grain scale. 750 grains, this rock. Can you imagine getting hit with that? People who know ammunition. If you don't know, it's just... Yeah. Yeah. You need weight up close, because I've done it for a living. Now we know why he had five. Now, the story continues. Goliath is dead. He cut the man's head off. A little boy ain't going to do that. How God created the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments, the bone structure here is the toughest thing on your body. Isn't that right? I had disc replacement surgery right here probably five or six years ago. The surgeon is telling me what he's going to do to my body. I did this. I said, I don't want to hear it because I know how to. He said, this is very industrial. He said, you'll be sore for a year. He said, this is, the surgeon said, this is the hardest part on the body to cut through. Cutting a man's head off, I'm not trying to sound more, but a little kid ain't doing that. It's just not happening. And then what we found out later in the storyline, he takes the head to town. Why? Because the Philistines had seized Jerusalem, and he was taking the head to town not to show the Israelites, but to show the Philistines you're next. That's what he's saying. A little boy ain't doing that. How do I know? Read the Bible. Okay? It's not some little boy with a little bitty rock. It's a man that did that. Okay? It's a man, and then we really know at the end of the story, or end of this story, the women started singing songs. They're singing songs to David because they know he's the king. Okay? They knew he was the king. Question number two on the table Who are the Philistines anyway? This is my favorite part of the lesson. If you do not know who they were, this will, you will, your mind will explode. This will really, really help you when you're reading and studying the Bible. I wish I had time to tell you all the details, but we've got to go fast. This is why this is a meat and potato lesson. We know from history, biblical history, when the Israelites crossed the red, that it was the worst day in Egyptian culture. They lost their workforce. They lost their king, the Pharaoh. They would have lost government officials, military, military soldiers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They would have not lost all of them because Egypt wasn't stupid. If you were living, breathing, walking on planet Earth during that time, you would have wanted to live in Egypt because they were the biggest and the baddest and they had all the amenities. That's where you would have wanted to live. But they lost their workforce. It was a horrible day for them. So what we know from now, if you've been in Faith Bible Institute, we learned so much of how much the Egyptian culture kept up records. So we know from Egyptian culture, that day when they lost, all the workforce force when the Israelites left, that they went out and hire, hired people to come in to live in the homes that the Israelites, you know, straight out of Egyptian history. Who they hired, they referred to them as people of the sea. That's the terminology, people of the sea. They would have lived on the coastlines. You go across the Mediterranean, and they inhabited all those islands that you see on the map. You know, just the people of the sea. The people of the sea had a turnkey deal. They wasn't where the Israelites lived. It wasn't shacks. They didn't have poverty. 
They were living in the best land that there was. How do I know? Because the Bible said it. They would have had the best vineyards, the best orchards, the best hay fields, the best everything. So you've got another family group that comes in and moves in and lives where somebody just walked out of. The people of the sea, their population grew because they was in the best. Guess who they turned out to be? They turned out to be the Philistines from Egyptian records. Pretty cool. You can see now why they hated one another. When the Israelites were wandering around in the wilderness because they made those mistakes, wandering around for 40 years, they knew somebody was living in their homes. How do I know? Because the Bible says it. It says who they were. The Bible doesn't say it was the Philistines then, but Egyptian records that they hired them to come in and work the jobs, do everything, and they were just turnkey. You can see why they hated each other in the same battles going on today. That's how they're fighting over land. They're fighting over property. I thought about it like this. Because we're all emotional. God created emotional creatures. I live on County Road 3197. And others. 3197. If I see somebody driving down my county road and I don't know who they are, I'm frustrated. You don't want to ride with me if I see, but if I see Joe or see somebody, hey, and that's on my road. What if I had to abruptly move out of my house and I found out Somebody was living in my house, sleeping in my bed, eating the deer meat in my freezer. Those are fighting words. Okay? They just are. That's not Christ-like, but that's what's going to happen. Because I was born and raised here. I know that property out there better than anybody. It's, it's mine, but it's not mine, but it's mine. That's the way I think. That's, what the, that's why they were fighting over that land. And then the storyline continues when they finally cross the Jordan to finally get to the land blowing of milk and honey, which is not symbolism, literally. Who do you think was living there? The Philistines, because their population was unbelievable. Why do you think they hate each other so much? The storyline continues. Ten or twelve years ago, the History Channel comes out with the Vikings. I watched that and said, this has got to be the coolest stuff ever, because there's swords and shield maidens and fighting and all that good stuff. I didn't know anything about the Viking culture first couple episodes we were watching an episode i grabbed the remote and i paused and i told my wife i said that right there is straight out of the bible she goes what i said that is right out of the bible i said who are these vikings anyway i didn't know nothing didn't know anything about them i'm studying the vikings the viking culture believed in witchcraft and all these gods and deities and satanism and all this stuff the viking culture descendants of the philistines and obviously there's a big gap in there and we don't have time to tell you all the different groups in our Faith Bible Institute study guide, there's some paragraphs in there that talk about the Viking culture. People in here who went through the class probably read it. The Viking culture stopped because someone stepped up to the plate and shared the gospel with them. I, I wish I had time to tell you the entire story. But now you know when you read that information in the Bible who the Philistines were, that's who took over their land. That's who was living in them, their homes when the Israelites were out there eating the honey wafers, eating quail and water, and they had everything else. You see, you see how emotional you get over property like that? I'm the same way. If you don't, well, you're just lying to yourself, or you've been moving around a bunch. Me and Joanne know what we're talking about, don't we, out there? We talked about that when you walked in, didn't you? That's the first thing you told me, wasn't it? Yeah. We were worrying about who's messing with us on our road. So, that that's right. See? That's, we get emotional about that stuff. Last but certainly not least, why the story even in the Bible? You can have a bunch of bullet points and why and why. What can we learn from David and Goliath? One thing that I picked up on, just one and we're done. David, when he saw the issue at hand, he did not procrastinate. He didn't procrastinate. He didn't run back and ask Samuel what to do. He didn't whine and cry to Samuel like all the Israelites were. He didn't even run back and ask his daddy. A little boy would have done that. He was a man. He took the right tool. Picked out the right rock. He got the job done. He didn't procrastinate. The question on the table is, do you procrastinate? It's easy to see people's personality that does. I mean, you can't really hide the fact if you you are a procrastinator. Another question is, do we procrastinate here at Landmark? Do we? Unfortunately, we do. I've been a member here just as long longer than anybody. We procrastinate not knowing that we do. We're not wanting to procrastinate. We're not wanting to do that. 
It's in our church culture that we procrastinate. It's in church tradition here that we procrastinate because we're wrapped up with church committees. We just are. And by definition, that's procrastination. Because if you're on a church committee, because I'm on several, when can you meet? I don't know. When can, when can you meet? And then you finally meet, and you get information, and you got to give it to the brotherhood, because that's how we do things. And brotherhood just meets one Sunday a month. And you can see the delay. We're not trying to delay. I'm not anti-committee, because I'm on committees. I'm just anti-procrastination. You follow the, the difference? We really have to watch that here. Because I know nobody in this room wants that to happen. And here's why. Because we're smart. We have a smart church, literally. We have a smart church. We're very diverse. We have a very diverse culture here, even in a small town, which is a good thing. We're unbelievably talented for a small church. And look at all the tools of the trade that God's blessed us here with. We should not even remotely even consider procrastination here because we don't know about it here, especially the Wednesday night group. We do not want to delay anything in the Lord's work, and I know we all agree on that. We just have to really have to think, be a David is what I'm telling you. Last but certainly not least, and I'm done. The verse has been up there, and I haven't forgot about it. Tonight's lesson title was make a showing. That's what my father would tell me. It was his definition of don't procrastinate. That's what he always told me. David wrote that, if you don't, hadn't figured that out by now. If you study David's life, then go back and study what he wrote. Cast. This is what he's talking about. He's talking about his sling. We don't use that word in our vocabulary. We, talk, we think cast. We're thinking about we're fishing. Let's go casting. We think actually fishing. He's talking about this, and we know what the burden is. That verse, personally, should be probably in your top ten of your personal verses to have to memorize as you talk to God. That should be in your top 10. That one's so easy. You, it, it's, you don't even have to explain it to the Wednesday night meat potato class, okay? Let's stand up. We're done. Let's go ahead. Let me go ahead and do, just do a quick review while we're standing. The three questions that we had was, why did David have to be the one to kill Goliath? David had to be the one to kill Goliath because he was the king. God wanted somebody. God picked him out with all those personality traits that he had to reign and rule over Israel for the next 40 years. He needed somebody like we saw on the screen up there. Who were the Philistines anyway? Now you know the rest of the story. Next time you're studying the Bible, that's who moved in and lived with the Israelites when they moved out. And last but certainly not least, do not procrastinate. Let's pray and we're done. Lord, thank you, Lord, for this great lesson. Thank you, Lord, for putting this storyline in the Bible just for us just to pick up on a few things. Help us, Lord, to... Never, never, never skip through a story in the Bible. Help us to, to look at it for what it is. Thank you, Lord, for everybody here, and, and bring us back here on Sunday. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you all for sitting down.